A note to listeners, Straight Up Care and Reduce the Stigma intentionally avoids stigmatizing language. However, we do not censor the language of individuals with lived and living experience. We respect their right to use the words they prefer. Welcome to Reduce the Stigma, brought to you by Straight Up Care. Today we have an episode of Meet the Peer, a special series where we shine the spotlight on peer specialists. I'm your host, Whitney Menarchek, and on this episode of Meet the Peer, we have Roger Cruel, Jr., a certified peer support specialist in North Carolina. Welcome, Roger. Hi. How you doing, Whitney? Thanks for having I'm, me. I'm good. Um, th- thank you for joining me. I'm excited uh, to learn more about you and for others to be able to hear your story. So if we <laughs> can just start right there with your story, your journey and lived experience. My journey starts back, it dates back um, in my teenage years, where it was more than following the leading. You know what I mean? You come from a low-income family, uh, and all the older guys, as you was growing up, you seen all the older guys. It was back then you was seeing drugs and alcohol. It was cool looking to do those things. Nobody taught you how to drink responsible and, and all that, but and as time rolls on, it, my drinking, I started probably like 13 years old. And it was just the more to, to fit in, to fit in with the, because I didn't like being home. My father was the best father in the world. And I seen my mom work her fingers to the bone to support six kids. So there, you already had some deep rooted. I didn't want to be home. So you're looking for love outside of the house, trying to find. So you start, I start hanging with older guys. And try to so-called prove myself to them. I did things that you shouldn't be doing at 13 years old. And as time goes on, drinking and everything picks up. You know, you start out with marijuana and they end up later in life with cocaine. So, but in between that time, my demon was alcohol. It was the root of my whole demise of everything. So, And as my journey going, I was an athlete in school and hid some things fairly well. You know, you start smoking your cigarettes and all that. And it's, again, just social stuff. I never had a problem because after the popularity came, you still didn't know what to do with yourself because I wasn't understanding me. I was locked within myself. I ain't an angry black kid, a black male kid. And and, and it, it was just one of them things. And around after high school, you know, I I was kind of lost. I was in between. I got a scholarship to pay ball at Craven Community College. I didn't take the SAT, so I had to start out on a JUCO level. I was pretty decent in basketball, and um, and end up dropping out of that. And then, in the transformation to going to Liberty City State, what happened? Crack code cane was introduced to the community. And instead of going transferring, I hung around and tried to make money, per se. And things went horribly wrong. There was some money came um, came up short, they said. And the guys came looking for me. And, was, and there was a shoot. There was gunplay. In so many words. I ended up shooting someone, two of them. End up serving, getting sentenced to 15 years in prison, which was later cut to seven and a half years. Um, once I got out, this was 1993. 1998, I was released. And with not finish, finishing college and all that stuff, I was still kind of lost in the world. And still very young. Yes. I was, but I'm missing most of my twenties. That that life that you should be enjoying yourself and figuring out yourself. I was, I was lost. So after returning back to society, I didn't know. Still, it was still anger. I would say 
Like, it was still and, and drinking started back drinking again. After all that time, did you was you sober for five years, nine months. Right. So now you get back out, you go fall in the same groove in that vortex. After you done put you promise yourself in there, oh, I'm gonna do right. You you because your whole thing back then is to do right. You know, it's just just that prism promise that I see everybody go through. So end up going out 98, 1998. I get my first DWI. So you rebound at that. You still don't recognize you have a drinking problem. But you're going to work. You you making excuses. I started, you know, like most alcoholics, you start making excuses for yourself. Oh, I go to work. I pay my bills. I do this and I do that. Not knowing you don't face the face. You're not facing them demons that's within you. 2001, I get another DW. I end up with three. 2004, I get another. Slacks are suspended indefinitely. Not knowing how valuable they were. Yeah. But grace is today. Fast forward today. I got my license, all that stuff back now because I cleaned up my life. But then you go back. I tried to run for my property. So I moved out of state. Trying to say, okay, if I leave this situation and go somewhere else, things will get better. Not knowing back then you didn't know. You carry you wherever you go. And whatever's in your heart, you would still feed. It's like the tale of the two wolves, you know, one will leave the other to go. But whatever you feed is the one you you tend to go to. So, and it was still drinking. And it still was causing me problems. I just refused to say drinking was the problem of my life. The, all the bad decisions and everything else. So you get there, you know, I was married then. That's my ex-wife. End up, did, it didn't work. Because my intentions wasn't good when you went there. Right. It was still, you know, to get away. I did care for her, but, but the drinking still continued. It's almost like you're hurting on the inside. You're crying and you want somebody to hear you, but you're scared to let it out. For the fear of being, oh, you weak, you soft. And that's in the black community. That's a, a lot of black male goes through it. Then you go to other cultures, and it is because male's supposed to be a strong, dominant figure, show no weakness, no signs. Men don't cry. Right. But what happened when all this pressure build up in you? And drinking was my outlet. Fast forward to take you fast forward to take the drinking carried on up to now to about five years ago with bad decision, poor decision making skills, and then more trouble. And I finally got it right. Finally, something did hit me. My current wife now, married of 12 years, and she kept telling me, go back to school. You're better than that. I see so much better than you. You don't see in yourself. And I thank God for her every day. Because she, she put up with so much. She left at a period of time to get me to realize, look, hey, I can't stay in this. I refuse to be treated like this, and you better than this. You don't see yourself. I'm not going to sit here and drown with you. So I went back to LCC. Um, I ended up losing everything. She left. We was in Greensboro, North Carolina, and lost it all. He ain't going up doing a year in jail for Mr. Men of Chick Fraud. I was homeless, you know what I mean? I had to eat, so not making an excuse for it. It was wrong. But I ended up getting caught for it. And they said, okay, you're Mr. Men time. Uh, like I said, when I got out, when I got released, I had nowhere to go. And I'm from Trenton, North Carolina, so one of my cousins, he, he came and he found me and he, he said, I can't have you living in the streets, but I can't, I don't have space for you home. You know, I got a wife and kids too. Now. But what I can do, you're going to have to go back to home. I know you don't want to, you, you know, it's nothing there, and but you got to go back. So some clicked in and I I can move back. Um, but I had a goal in mind at this point. I something got to change. Something had to change. So I made up my mind and enrolled back in college. I wanted to go to be a chef. Believe it or not, I, I think I can cook. <laughs> Everybody seemed to enjoy it. But some kept nagging me and pulling me the other way, said, nah. 
human service technology, go be a counselor. Wow. So in there, in, in when you study, when I got in and studied, you nervous. I was 48 at the time. So you're 48 years you know, going back to school. So you done miss a lot. You've been out of, been removed from education for this period of time. So it was a scary thing, but I did it. I had so I had a goal. I had something to do. I got to get the other side. I got to leave this past alone. I got to keep running from things, face your problems, and go. So after that, you know, and did well, but all the, the study and the case notes and the demonstrations that we did, role playing and all this, and I can see myself in so many of these things. So many. And it was unbelievable. So after I graduated, my wife threw a party off. Birthday slash graduation party. It was around May. My birthday is like May 26th. So Memorial Day, you know, graduated at the top of May. Some just, and it came to me, see, all this time, I know we don't we don't talk about how or power. We say how or power, but God, you know what I mean? It's all of a sudden you begging them all the time. Please release me from the demons, the things that I'm fighting. And people tell me you're great. You know, you just don't see yourself. Once you remove, you'll get yourself out of the way. Watch what God will put in your life and do for your life. So at the birthday party, I took one last drink and that's been it. So the moment you graduated was the moment that you also moved into your recovery. It sounds like Mm -hmm. that's incredible. And so you're a counselor. And a peer specialist. Yes. Obviously, those two are very similar. I mean, they're they're both about helping people through difficult times. Peer specialist is has the perspective of that lived experience. What led you once you achieved the the counseling uh, program or completed it? What led you to also want to go and become a certified peer specialist? Go back and get the ones that's lost. Like you said, they similarities, but we don't. We kind of walk them through it. You know they're struggling. They don't. They don't. They're not at that point. They really want to give anything up. But you try to. You just walk with them and let them know. Hey, I've been there. I've been there before. And you can kind of be an example to them. After they figure out, you know, I mean, you get build that rapport with them, and they start asking questions. How did you do it? Right? How do you do it? So that's why I kind of went back for that. One. You know, I mean, it's more hands on. You know what I mean? You, you directly, you can see they pain. You can feel they pain. You've been there before. You know they yeah, cry. Right. Right. Yeah, you know they cry. So, yeah, that's why I made them into it. And, you know, I think there's something to be said also about the, you know, in counseling, there's very, you try very hard not to let the power differential play a role, but it does. It You're does. going to this professional you know, and that can result in, in walls going up, understandably. Whereas with a peer specialist, it's equal footing, right? It, it's less of a fear of judge. I imagine less of a fear of judgment, more of a you. Like you said, you get it. You, you know the pain. Yeah. You know and, they're struggling. You know what they're trying to do. Because some people they they want the help. They're crying out for help. They just don't know how to ask for it. And we know you didn't. Just, like I say, it's no judging, it's no judge on. You just let them know, I've been there. Hey. I've been there. I know what you're going through. The similarities are the same journey that I have walked. So what to keep you from going back in the fire, hey, you have to look at it this way. Or okay. try doing it this way. And things might look up, you know. Absolutely. And you know, there's been a, a shift. There's much more uh, support and recognition of the role of peer specialists, of someone with that lived experience helping along the way. What would you say is one of the reasons why peer support is so important? Good question. It's, it's, it's much needed. Now that you look every time you turn on TV and you're in your communities and society that with the fentanyl and the overdoses and it's it's all over now it's in you it's, it's everywhere it's crying it's streaming for help somebody please help as a community as a whole and i think that's what peer support brings more 
because it's more in the community. It's more, it's coming, it's directly towards them and it's not, and once again, it's, it's non judgment on. You can relate to them. You can relate to the alcohol. You can relate to the addict that's over. You can relate to the pain. And you just want to send them to stop hurting. You just want them to stop hurting eight days away. Come, with, you know, it, it, there's hope at the end of this. And you've touched on your alcohol use. You talked about um, incarceration and returning to the community, which is not easy. And, you know, talk about a time when people need support. What Are there any other life experiences that you like to help someone uh, when you're working with them as a peer specialist? With that, with everything that's coming, because, you know, people blow their finances to open up just to let them know, you know, I mean, there's better things you can do with your money or invest in, you know, once they see themselves getting on the other side of that. So, yeah. I love that. I think that's a skill that I mean. I don't think it's taught enough in school. Um, and when someone it, it has an addiction, you know, money isn't, you're not planning long-term. No. It, and so I think that, and that financial stability is so important for, for I mean, the finance, stress of finances can be the thing that leads someone back to use. Um, and so I think that's an amazing thing to be able to offer to someone to help them out. Um, and support them in, in learning how to manage their money. money. So that's really exciting here. <laughs> yes, it is. And I had to come to terms. I wasn't really bad with money, but when you just out, when you when the spotlight's on you and your popularness, you, say you, you still want that fake love, I call it. So you blow money. You blow more money than you take it in. Right. Because all drinks on me, everybody do, you know, you it's that big ball of lifestyle. And, but now that I know how to, if it's not giving me an ROI, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but that's one of the things, you know what I mean? They need, because we know triggers, sometimes money triggers, you know, they got it in hand, they got to go blow it, you know, this. So if we get them to that, that cognitive behavior, but you teach finance, because like I say, nobody taught us in school, we had to learn the hard way, because I had to, Back then, the day. moms didn't know, dads didn't know. All I seen was, I can't pay this bill this month. I have to make payment right. So how to, can they teach me about finances or anybody around me that's below the poverty line? They're all struggling. Mm -hmm. So they don't know about, back then it wasn't a 401k, but investing in some kind of stocks or bonds or CDs. You've seen people just sit there, there. You thought everybody lived the same way till you go outside that box. And then you're like, oh, wow. They have a nice house. They have a nice So nobody talks about your credit and what that score really means to you. Right. It's almost value is your social security number. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it, it can really take you know, and there are unfortunately a lot of programs out there that are predatory and no people are in a tough spot. And so they'll, you know, offer, you know, different payday loans and things like that, where it, someone just gets stuck in a loop of not being able to get ahead. Yeah, it keeps you in the vortex. So once you know to keep your uses up on a 30%. You know, and stuff like that. There's nobody teach you that. You know, when you got a brand new car, it's got this limit on it. Let's go use it. And then you see your rate, you see your store falling, and you see this going up. And But you manage your money. They say, oh, we got somebody that know how to do this. That's, a, that's a, such an important life skill. It is. And so um, one of the things that we always ask peers is, you know, there's a lot of stigma. You you have experienced a lot i mean substance use incarceration that's a lot there's a lot of stigma there what would you like to say if you could say one thing to challenge stigma in that can be in the broadest sense or a specific type of stigma what would you like to say now 
being a black male in America. That's the stigma. <laughs> That's the stigma with the NSF. And maybe I can go on and on about that, but that's challenging for us. Yes, you want to be a voice. You want to be. But we got to learn as a people, you know, especially black males. We are targeted in some forms, but you don't want to put a bigger bullseye on your back. So. So for us, that's that's what it is. That's that stigma. It's just we got to get over it. It's out. So just being black in America, a black male in America. Right. And if you would be open to sharing a little bit more about that intersectionality of multiple components of your identity or your experiences and how the stigma can add on to one another. Because it, it often, see, we was taught, like in our community, Black, we don't share. We don't. We don't bond. We don't do this. We just told you don't cry. Take it to God. Well, you know, you know, white kind of part. Go see therapists. Talk it out. Relate. See, they differ things. And do we get treated fairly? Eh, probably not. We can say to have same education, same thing, everything else. But we kind of notice that it'll go to that. You know, white counterpart. Other than that, it's a lot being a black male in America. You know, I mean, some people just don't believe it. They like get over it. That happened a long time ago. You know, you can't really feel it till you live in it. So you know, outside of looking in, and it's more because if you look at the ratio until the opioid epidemic, the crack epidemic wiped out our community. Right. <laughs> And yeah, I'm telling you, and and it's almost if you was on a conspiracy theory, look like it was by design. Because now your age rate go up, the crime rate go up, your kids is less intended to, your black males, they're more black males in prison than they is in college. So if you look at the whole overall thing, it's, yeah. And for anyone who, who is listening and doesn't know, the laws, the um, you know, war on drugs that was initiated was whether it was in- outwardly intentional or not. There was a severe discrepancy in how sub you know uh, crimes involving um, you know possession and such were handled based off of what was typically commonly used by white individuals compared to commonly used by black individuals. And yes. it led to the incarceration rates just skyrocketing. And so anyone who doesn't know, I encourage you to educate yourself on that because that has contributed decades later to why there are still such health disparities. Um, and what we can't, we can't overlook that. See, fact, you know, witness he, and thanks for for brought you you know about this. So that's one of the things that's being us. We got to keep up with current affairs and everything else. But when you see that kind of number staggering like that, it makes you think one day maybe they have a point here. Because as you spoke, a a, a gram of crack versus an ounce of powder. Okay, you get a slap on the hand, you get twenty years in prison. Right. And then the the impact, the generational impact. And you, you see know? what it has done. Yes, you go down. If I come out the door and you see drinking and drug selling, father's absent, mom on drugs, you defend the left for yourself. So the next thing you cling to as a male is your dope dealer. You seeing violence, you seeing prostitution, you seeing all this right in your front door. So as soon as you walk out the door. So environmental, you're going to probably end up a statistic too. You're going <laughs> to. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, it's saddening. And you, when you look at it, it so, you know, so. it is, it, it, it really is. And, and that's why there has to be systemic changes and big movements. Not, we can't just say, oh, pull, someone needs to pull themselves up from the boot, their bootstraps or whatever. Because that's not taking into account their experiences or the lack of opportunities or the barriers 
because of things that could have happened long ago, but are definitely still happening today. Yeah, because when it's almost designed to make you fail, the obstacle just got that much greater. Right. And it doesn't help because they think that you can help yourselves out. But when it's almost designed to, to for failure, now that's going to take some a lot of discipline and a lot of, like, I need focus, mental focus. Because if you got a kid got to fight to get to school every day, shootings, he doesn't seem to be a bother or needle hanging out of somebody's arm before they can reach 13 years old. That's, that's a problem. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say, you know, I mean, it didn't. Now people are paying attention to it because it's in the suburbs. Opioids is in the suburbs. You got soccer moms is now, and you don't want them coming down in in the projects or in the hood. Right. So it's it's a difference, you know. I mean, uh, when people can talk on a level and realize things, then you can have conversations about this. Instead of just saying, hi, quit complaining, quit doing this. But it's real. Look at it. It's real. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot, there's a, there's people like to say addiction and things like that doesn't discriminate, which is true in the fact that anyone can become, you know, but there is a discrepancy in the outcomes. You know, we know that black men are dying at a higher rate from overdose. And why is that? It's not because of who they are, who they are as a person. It's because whenever they go into an emergency room, they get different care. And that's not okay. And so we have to look at it and, and make sure that we're taking into account whatever is going on that we need to eliminate those barriers and give each person the best opportunity Thank you. while taking their experience into consideration. It is. Because we all human beings. You know what I mean? That's a, that's a human. That's a human being. I'm a human being. You're a human being. You know what I mean? So... Once we get over that little piece, you know what I mean? Because it is. Addiction doesn't care. It's undefeated. They don't care how much money you just can buy more of it. On a larger scale, they're going to make it plentiful for you can get it now. You know, there's a lot of things happen when when a kid is left having eaten for days. Parents strung out on drugs. Some of them never come home. They're murdered in the streets. See that that's that mental thing. That's mentally that's why, you know, it's it's a lot of stuff in the in the communities is basically mentally. It starts mentally. You know, you can't get over. You've seen some stuff you can't unsee. And some people can't get past that. So if you we try to give everybody a shot at something, to be something. A ca- a child haven't asked for this unless the parents was or she was born addicted or she was born addicted. We need to give them a, a, a helping hand somewhere. Right. And then that parent that's that's the addict need to look back and say, this is the only person that you caring for. You can't do it in your state. It's no fun when when the social service had to come and snatch a kid out of our home. Now you got to look at that. People in foster homes. See, now they angry. Why nobody wants me? See, people, when people use, I have noticed, it's to match the pain. But it would never go anywhere until you deal with the pain. We know, you know, you got to deal with it. You got to get it out. You got to talk about it and forgive it. Forgive them. Forgive yourself and move on. Yep. Like you said earlier, uh, you, you tried to move away, but it doesn't matter. Who you are goes with you. Um, <laughs> and so you got to look internally, do, do some real hard work. Um, yeah, because I'm leaving now. You know, when I when I do the group sessions and stuff, I often now mention about shadow work. Hmm. You probably heard about it. It's when you just quiet place, meditate. It's meditating. It's all this. You got to get them demons out. You got to face them. You know, I mean, you can try to because we know how to pretty much read people and all that stuff nowadays, and know when they're trying to lead you somewhere you don't want. You know. Trying to mask it, try to, you know, minimize it. And once we know, yeah. But until they can come with their true selves, they'll always start lying to themselves. They'll make the excuse to, to take that step back, slip, relapse, or whatever. 
Because most of them they've been doing it so long, they don't know how to live so long. But then okay. you got to love yourself. So self care, self development. I, I kind of this is what I, I, I kind of found that when I'm talking to them, they can relate more when I talk about self love and self love. But first, you got to come to terms with yourself. You got to start liking you again and loving you again. If that's called for some selfishness, yes, it's going to take some of that. The old habits, the old friends, the old places, we know them in situations. But we, you got to learn how to do things now through a sober lens. And build up those skills, those abilities, and belief in yourself. That's it. Yeah. It starts with you. Everything starts with you. We can sit here, we can lead you. There's an old saying you can leave a horse to water. You can't make him drink. And that's yeah. true in all aspects of life. You know? yeah. But if we give them the tools, we show them there's another way out. Give them the tools to work with and they apply them to us. The success rate would be a much higher. If that person just start believing and said they life is worth living. Right. But I have to do it so. So if it means cutting off the old friends, because like just last night I gave us out. I said, what is the common denominator? When you was out in the streets and you were hanging, what is the common denominator? Why y'all was hanging? Take that away. Do they talk? Do they call you just to say, hey, how you doing? Or do they call you, hey, let's go this. Such and such got the better stuff over there. They call you about a drug or I'm having a party. Let's get drunk. Let's do this and that. And I told them, during this holiday season, you have to watch this. The old friends ain't seen you in a while. Them people coming home always say, one won't hurt or this, just take this. It won't hurt them, but it's going to hurt you. It's going to destroy your life. You can't mess with it at all. You can't flirt with it. Don't be tempted by it. Just remove yourself. Because oh, you think you're better than me now? No, I'm just a better me. Hmm. Wow. Well, my final question for you uh, mm -hmm. is there, there will inevitably be someone who watches your interview, listens uh, to it, and they're having a difficult time. They're struggling. What would you mm -hmm. like them to hear? Take the time. When you're going through something, it's always good to talk to that higher power. If you can't find you a sober friend, that's why it's so, so important to have an accountability partner to talk you down. Find a hobby. Do something constructive. But the thing is, there are going to be struggles and you're going to have rough days. But remember what you're fighting for. So that'll be my main thing. Remember who you are and what you are fighting for. It's not going to be easy. Because you be coming to the unknown, but you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. I think we can all do a little bit better with that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's wonderful. And I just have to thank you so much, Roger, for, for taking the time to join me today, just sharing your story, being so open and, and what an you know, and a, a remarkable story. You've, and you've come so far, you've accomplished so much, and you are just giving back in different ways. And I'm sure impacting so many lives. Believe in yourself. You know, I mean, you got, you, you got a much better man than this. See, I couldn't have made this journey without people that believed. And a man believed he can, he's his own island, sadly, mistake. You got to be humble yourself, be grateful, and be thankful. You know, you look back now, and I do, I get, you know, and I just think of this, when the preacher's up there preaching, or the pastor, or the bishop, or whatever, at the end of every sermon, he asks somebody to come up. If you're willing to change your life, please come to the point. As with us, as we, we mentor, we counsel, we do this. If we only change one life, we did so. If we just change one, then you can have many, but we just change one. That's that person that didn't hang himself that night. Or go home and take a handful of pills. Kind words to say, hey, how you doing? Glad to see you moving. Just words are just powerful itself. Just act like kindness. Well, I'm sure you're making an impact on more than one life, but I, <laughs> I understand completely. You know, it's 
an amazing thing to be able to help someone else. And if you are out there and you're listening and you want to work with Roger and uh, receive peer support services from him, you can find him on uh, straightupcare.com forward slash members. And on behalf of Straight Up Care, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please join us on our mission to reduce the stigma by liking, sharing, and leaving us a review. You can watch our full episodes on our Amazon Fire and Roku TV channels, as well as at ReduceTheStigma.com. Reduce the Stigma is hosted by me, Whitney Minarchek, edited by Sarah Elash, and music by Audiosphere. This has been a Straight Up Care production.